G'day, I'm Gary Stevens, and welcome to the third season of the History in the Bible podcast. In this final season, I explore how the Jews and the Christians constructed new religions when they were sent spinning into the void after the destruction of the temple. All of the history about all of the books beyond the Bible. Episode 3.1, The Heirs of Abraham. Welcome to the sixth anniversary and the third and final season of the History in the Bible. This season is an extended denouement to the 140 published episodes for the first two seasons of the show. I expect it will run for a year. I thought about changing the title to something like History After the Bible. But why not exploit the brand? Over the next year or so, I will explore the evolution of the heirs of Abraham, rabbinical Judaism, and Christianity. I will move from the deaths of Paul and Peter in the early 60s AD to around the year 200. My show is driven by the tempo of history, a rhythm punctuated by three Judean revolts. The first is the Great Judean Revolt of 66. That doomed attempt at independence resulted in the devastation of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Temple. The religion whose very heart and soul was the Temple had to reinvent itself or die. The Jesus clubs were equally stricken. Jesus, his disciples, and Paul had all been good Judeans, sacrificing at the Temple. What were the clubs to do with the temple gone? Fifty years later, Judeans throughout the eastern Mediterranean erupted in a rampage that the Romans called the Tumult of the Jews. We know it as the Kittos War. Some moderns call it the War of the Diaspora. This war is really obscure, believe me. In the year 132, Judeans again launched a revolt against Roman rule the revolt of Bar Kosiba. That was even more calamitous. The entire city of Jerusalem was razed. The province of Judea was depopulated. The thriving Jewish communities throughout the eastern Mediterranean were stifled. After this final revolt, Judeans for the first time became a suspect and suspicious minority, forbidden to enter the city of David. Let's begin the season with what we know of the sister faiths just before the First Judean Revolt in 66. Peter and Paul had died only a few years before. The followers of Jesus were scattered across the eastern Mediterranean and Italy in little clubs established by travelling preachers. Most of their problems were parochial. What should we do about Demas, the adulterer? A few were theological. Is Jesus returning in glory next month or next year? Surely very soon, though. The clubs all thought of Jesus as their hero and themselves as the bearers of his true teachings. Exactly what these teachings were was a matter of contention. We know from Paul's letter that the clubs differed in their understanding of what Jesus said, what he did, and what he meant. An important question many had was how to look on Judaism. The clubs regarded themselves as somehow connected to the Jewish religion. They could not agree on what this connection was. Paul's letters show that he struggled to make it clear even to himself. Converts from Judaism still thought of the temple as the centre of their religious world. Pagan converts knew little of the temple. If the Jesus clubs had any sacred scriptures, they were those of the Judeans, the Tanakh or Old Testament. I doubt that the Gentile members of the clubs knew much about these books. All they saw was the good news proclaimed by the preachers, a teaching fashioned by a Jewish man from the tiny province of Judea. The only other writings they had were the letters of the travelling preachers. 
Perhaps Paul's letters were the most famous of these. But it is entirely possible that dozens of letters from many other missionaries were floating around, all now lost to time. If the Romans thought anything at all about the Christians, they regarded them as a branch of Judaism, albeit a sect with missionary zeal. The Romans had established a century-old concordat with the Judeans. Since the time of Herod the Great, Rome had supported his dynasty as an anchor to keep the many other nationalities in the region from floating away into rebellion and mayhem. The Romans esteemed Judaism as a bona fide religion, one just as worthy of respect as many other religions in the empire. The Judeans enjoyed special protections and privileges, especially in their homeland. They were exempt from military service and from performing the pagan state rituals they found so offensive. For a century, Rome was no enemy to the Judeans, but a friend. The Judeans had only to look within to find enemies. The Judean bodies, politic and religious, were rent into sects. Essenes, Zealots, Sadducees, Boethusians, Sicarii, and Pharisees. And certainly others whose names have not passed down to us. Their antagonisms sometimes erupted into bloody violence. Judeans had established communities throughout the eastern Mediterranean, as far as Rome and Cyrenaica, modern Libya. They were especially populous in Egypt and the island of Cyprus. In his missionary work, Paul encountered many Judean communities in Asia Minor, modern Turkey, and Greece. Dispersed as these communities were, most regarded the temple as the great pivot of their world. Male Judeans everywhere paid an annual tithe to the temple. Judean men were supposed to attend the temple three times a year at the great festivals. Still, quite a few of the sects thought the temple was an axis of evil. Although obliged to acknowledge its power and symbolic force, the sects held the fat cat establishment in contempt. Some advocated alternatives to the ritual sacrifices demanded by the priestly caste. From the time of Alexander the Great, the Judean homeland had been tossed between Hellenistic powers. Through those long centuries, Jewish intellectuals wrote dozens of books. Some of these were apocalypses, predicting in lurid detail how their God would wage a great war on earth and in heaven to liberate little Judea from its oppressors. I explored many of those in season two, and I'll return to them later in this season. They also produced testaments, prayers and songs. Literate Judeans living just before the Great Revolt could argue over a rich literature, not just the Tanakh. By the end of my period, around the year 200, the two faiths had utterly transformed. The Jewish Jesus clubs founded by Peter and James had been devastated by three failed revolts. They were left without leaders and without hope. The few Jewish Jesus clubs that did survive found themselves as oddities in a sea of pagan Jesus clubs. At first, the clubs believed that Jesus could return at any time. As the decades passed by, the members of the Jesus clubs had to accept reality. They were not to be the last generation. They would have children and grandchildren. The clubs had no choice but to get their act together. The clubs quickly built an imperial organisation. The travelling preachers disappeared. The isolated communities networked into an international franchise, the church. This franchise constructed layers of administration. Presbyters, deacons, bishops. The individual churches talked to each other through their local bishops not through itinerant missionaries. As a burgeoning imperial establishment, the church found itself with imperial problems. The gaze of the authorities turned upon them. The emperors soon worked out that the Christians were not just oddball Judeans. They chose to regard Christianity 
as a dangerous new superstition and cult. In response, Christianity's best and brightest produced an explosion of literary exuberance. They composed elegant public defences to persuade the emperors that they were harmless. They also wrote homilies and sermons. They were keen to preserve their history. They wrote tens of gospels, memoirs of the time of Jesus. After that, they fabricated chronicles of the apostles. They also preserved accounts of early martyrs and letters from Christian worthies. Some of these books were eventually assembled into the New Testament, but there were many, many others. Some only recovered in their entirety, only in the modern era. It is only by historical accident that your copy of the New Testament does not include the Acts of Paul and Thecla, the Gospel of Judas, and the Shepherd of Hermas. While the Christian body corporate was grappling with the imperial challenge, the separate churches invented liturgies and rituals. Little manuals of worship, such as the Didache, began to circulate. Most churches performed a weekly celebration on the Lord's Day, now moved to a Sunday. Hostility from Rome was not the only problem Christianity faced. Every church had its own interpretation of Jesus. Each claimed to have the true understanding. Mashing all the independent little churches into a unified corporate entity proved a gruelling task. Towards the end of my period, some leaders of the newly born imperial church decided that many communities had misinterpreted Jesus. They reacted aggressively to these supposed transgressions compiling elaborate and vindictive catalogues, wrongdoers they call heretics. While the Christians were struggling to form themselves into a robust organisation in the face of Roman antagonism, and to work out what they believed, the Judeans were confronting an existential crisis. All the ancient social structures of Judea had been annihilated. Many of the social elites were dead, some by the hands of the Romans but perhaps even more by their own people. The sectarians who had so bitterly opposed the corrupt temple found themselves without a raison d'etre and faded into history. The surviving Jewish intellectuals worked hard to build new social structures and to reconstruct their religion. They produced a new survival manual, the Mishnah. They blotted the apocalypses from their collective memory. The Roman destruction of the temple was one blow. The failure of the last Jewish revolt against Rome in 136 AD, the death knell. After that time, the Judeans saw no hope of God coming in triumph to destroy Rome and restore the Judeans to their rightful place in God's plan. In Judaism, the apocalyptic literature survived only at the fringes, in mystical works. Even then, the mystics dropped the fascination with the end of days, and retained only the explorations of heaven, found as subplots in the apocalypses. Historians of Christianity are in an enviable position. From the very beginning, writing history was an essential part of the Christian enterprise. For a start, historians have a whole body of work undoubtedly written between the Great Revolt and the year 200 the New Testament. Still, until the 17th century, the West relied on the writings of two imperial bishops for most of its knowledge of earliest Christianity. These bishops preserved in their writings innumerable stories about important figures from Christianity's first two centuries. They also preserved tantalising quotations from these people, quotations from lost books. First is the famous Bishop Eusebius. Eusebius was renowned as one of the most learned Christians of his time. We know little of his origins and, well, pretty much nothing about the man. From what we can get, Eusebius was a career church bureaucrat. During the last and harshest persecutions of the Christian, he inconspicuously worked his way through the ranks of the church. Shortly after the Roman state legalised Christianity, In 315 AD CE, Eusebius was installed 
as Bishop of Caesarea Maritima, the old Roman capital of Judea. Eusebius was finally free to publish the masterpiece he had worked on for twenty years, the Ecclesiastical History. For this work, Eusebius is known as the father of church history. This wonderful document is one of the great ornaments of Christian scholarship. Eusebius provides stories of bishops and Christian teachers. He relates the history of the Judeans. He preserves vast slabs of quotations from authors now lost to us. We would be much the poorer without Eusebius. A generation later, he was followed as a historian by Epiphanius. Epiphanius was born a Romanite Jew a few years after the death of Eusebius. The Romaniates established themselves in Greece, possibly as far back as the time of Alexander the Great. If that is true, and we have little reason to doubt it, that would make them the oldest Jewish communities in Europe. They declined to identify themselves with any of the great branches of modern Judaism, Ashkenazim, Sephardim, or the Beta Israel. Today they number only a few hundred. At some point in his very long life of 80 or 90 years, Epiphanius converted to Christianity. He was installed as Bishop of Salamis in Cyprus. He spent a long and tedious 40 years in that position, to the frustration and annoyance of all those others hungry to accede to his bishopric. Amongst his other works, he wrote the Panarian, Medicine Chest. This offered antidotes to all the heresies he disapproved of. His rants preserve yet more information about lost work. Our numerous literary sources, the earliest history of Christianity, are both pagan and Christian. They name names and date dates. These sources are easily mined for great nuggets of historical gold. Students of 1st and 2nd century Judean history are reduced to panning for gold dust in rivers of uncertainty. The rabbis of early Judaism lacked the pagan and Christian preoccupation with writing histories. Matters are immensely complicated by the fact that the rabbis insisted they were passing down an oral tradition. We have little idea when the components of this tradition were set into writing. The oldest full copy of the survival manual, the Mishnah, that we possess dates only to the early Middle Ages. The oldest complete Christian New Testament manuscript we have was written about the year 320. The earliest fragment of the Mishnah we have is a mosaic dated to about 450, found in a Galilean synagogue. The earliest fragment of the New Testament is three centuries older. None of the early rabbinic documents name their author or hint at their date of composition. Prior to the much later written Talmudim, the early rabbis rarely refer to historical events, least of all to contemporary ones. They show little awareness that they are writing in the Greek-speaking portion of a mighty empire. They construct a world where Gentiles are a minority and a Gentile government irrelevant. We are left with a vast collection of undateable texts unanchored to history. The tragedy is that these documents are replete with the names and stories about generations of rabbis back to the time of Herod the Great. Were it not the insecurity of the evidence, we might have been able to transform these anecdotes into biographies. Eusebius and Epiphanius teased and frustrated Western scholars with their lengthy quotations from long-lost works. In the mid-1600s, the unsatisfied professors finally got their hands on complete editions of the very earliest of Christian documents, the letters of Pope Clement, Bishops Polycarp and Ignatius, and the Epistle of Barnabas. I'll cover all those documents soon. These letters arrived in the court of King Charles I of England, Scotland and Ireland. He ruled the disunited kingdom. Charles received the documents for the most unlikely of reasons. Here's intervention into Ottoman Turkish politics. 
Charles was a huge fan of Cyril Lucaris, Patriarch of Alexandria. Lucaris ended up as Cyril I, Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople. It's amazing he got that far. Cyril was always embroiled in trouble. He was deposed and banished several times. His flock disputed his orthodox credentials. The Spanish and French ambassadors to the Turkish court pressured the Sultan to get him out of the picture. Cyril was deeply learned and widely travelled. He was an admirer of Europe's Protestant reform. The Catholic nations found the prospect of some sort of Calvinized Orthodox Christianity horrifying. The English and Dutch supported the hapless Cyril. In gratitude, Cyril sent King Charles a Greek copy of the Bible. This is now known as Codex Alexandrinus. The Codex also contains complete versions of some of those letters that had so intrigued Christian scholars. You can hear more about the Codex in episode 2.24, Battle for the New Testament, part 4, Modern Times. And that's where things stood for another 200 years. In the 1880s, Victorian scholars finally laid their hands on an ancient manuscript that early church fathers had often referred to, but never quoted from. Some of the fathers even considered the book as canonical. This was the Didache, the teachings of the Twelve Apostles. As we now know, the Ethiopian Orthodox Christians preserved a version in their own New Testament. An adventurous Greek bishop recovered a complete manuscript of the Didache from a monastery in Istanbul. The discovery was a revelation. For the first time, scholars had an undoubtedly ancient manuscript of a Christian book hitherto known only by reputation. The manuscript was probably as old as parts of the New Testament. Today, the manuscript is dated to the very end of the Apostolic Age, about the year 100. The Didache is totally unlike anything in the New Testament. It is a book of church order. In 16 short chapters, it tackles morals and ethics, church practice, and the hope of the second coming of Christ at the end of time. The book lays out a general program for instruction and initiation. I'll have a lot more to say in later episodes. The Victorians were now primed for more exciting discoveries. They were awash with cuneiform tablets from Assyria and Babylon. They had almost no ancient documents from ancient Judaism and Christianity. More discoveries around the turn of the century sent scholars into paroxysms of delight. In the last years of the 19th century, European scholars descended on Egypt. The French archaeologist Urbain Bouillon carefully dug up the tomb of a Christian monk who died in the early Middle Ages. He was astonished to find that amongst the monk's prized possessions buried with him was a partial copy of the Gospel of Peter. The Gospel had been lost for centuries, preserved only in quotations. The discovery of the Gospel of Peter shocked biblical scholars. A brand new Gospel! The Gospel of Peter revealed to late Victorian professors the existence of a completely unexpected witness to Christian diversity. Bourillon had unearthed his gospel in Akhmim, a modest town on the Nile, 400 kilometres or 240 miles south of Cairo. The German scholar Karl Reinhardt recovered another find from Akhmim that he found in a Cairo antiquities market. We call it the Berlin Codex. It has been reliably dated to about the year 400. Scholars instantly recognised that it contained Egyptian Coptic versions of four Gnostic books, long quoted in and ridiculed by the Church Fathers. For the first time, scholars could listen to the Gnostics in their own voice, uncontaminated by the vitriol of their Christian opponents. If Bourillon and Reinhardt could uncover such wonders, lost for millennia. What more was there to be found? In 1896, two Scottish sisters and their, and I quote, 
irrepressibly curious rabbinical friend, Solomon Schechter, investigated a Geniza at the Ben Ezra Synagogue in Fustat, or Old Cairo, in Egypt. Now, the sister's description of Schechter is rather condescending. He was, after all, a professor at Cambridge University at the time. You can think of a synagogue Geniza as something like a sacred storeroom, if you are feeling generous, or a rubbish dump if you are not. You probably have a Geniza, although you call it an attic, a basement, or a shed. That's where you keep all those ancient photographs of relatives dead 50 years. You feel it would be sacrilegious to throw them into a dumpster, but you feel no compulsion to keep these relics in the house, let alone preserve them from mice and the fungi. The Cairo Geniza contained 300,000 Jewish manuscript fragments, written over a thousand years, from the early Middle Ages onwards. They are the largest and most diverse collection of medieval manuscripts in the world. The Geniza texts are written in various languages, especially Hebrew, Arabic, and Aramaic, mainly on vellum and paper, but also on papyrus and cloth. Schechter realised he had won a lottery that no one else even thought existed. For 50 years, the Cairo Geniza documents were the talk of the intellectual town. But in one sense, they were disappointing. The manuscripts did indeed push back the histories of some biblical books into a much more distant past. That was gratifying. But the only real surprise from the trove was an otherwise unknown book, later called the Damascus Dock, because it mentions the city of Damascus so often. I'll get to that soon. Solomon Schechter was confronted with innumerable questions. Where did the manuscripts come from? Who wrote them? When were they written? By struggling with these basic questions, Schechter founded modern scroll research. For centuries, scholars had searched for ancient manuscripts in old libraries and monasteries and synagogues. Solomon Schechter demonstrated that you might also find wondrous treasures in the ground, in rubbish tips. Enter now the British archaeologists Bernard Pine Grenfell and Arthur Surridge Hunt, hot on Schechter's coattail. Although only in their thirties, they were armed with solid classical educations and moustaches that could have been used as industrial pot scrubbers. The pair decided to excavate a garbage dump at Oxyrhynchus. This was the third largest city in Roman Egypt, a site hitherto unexplored. They hit a diamond mine, a bonanza, and a Aladdin's cave, a treasure trove. There are not words to describe how bigly they made it. They dug for years. While they found a few whole manuscripts, they did unearth millions of fragments, each about the size of a credit card. Our best guess is that these fragments belong to half a million documents. Half a million! Scholars have spent a century piecing all these fragments together and expect to be doing so for at least another hundred years, even with the help of modern technology. The fragments encompass a 1,000-year period, from Hellenistic Egypt to Roman Egypt to the Muslim conquest. Most are written in Greek or one of the Egyptian languages. Just a few are in Hebrew or Aramaic. They provide a vivid picture of ancient life, land deeds, legal contracts, sales receipts, divorce certificates and letters. Some are fragments of Homer and the Greek poets and some are Christian. These papyri are considered the earliest witnesses to the original text of the New Testament. Three vie for the honour of the very oldest. The smallest and probably oldest papyrus is called Ryland's P52. It is about the size of an index card, 9 by 6 centimetres or 4 by 3 inches. This contains five verses from the Gospel of John. A fragment labelled P66 contains most of the Gospel of John. P66 is a book of 75 pages, 
each a modest 15 by 15 centimetres large, about 6 by 6 inches. This papyrus looks like a draft because it's full of crossing out and scribbles. The third papyrus is P46, a whopper, at 86 rather large pages, 28 by 16 centimetres, 11 by 6 inches. P46 is our oldest copy of the Letters of Paul. Not that the papyrus contains all the letters. The pastoral letters, Timothy and Titus, are conspicuously absent. These three papyri are dated from 100 to 200 CE. No other New Testament manuscript comes even close to that antiquity. The Akmim Codex had kick-started investigations into Gnosticism. These inquiries were propelled into warp speed at the end of the Second World War. In 1945, an Egyptian farmer discovered 13 leather-bound books in a sealed jar in Nag Hammadi, a substantial town on the Nile, 80 kilometres or 50 miles southeast of Akmim. The farmer sold it to some shady characters for pittance, who onsold the books to equally dubious dealers. Eventually, it ended up in the hands of antiquities merchants that Western scholars could pretend to themselves were not entirely criminal. That's how these things work. Where the Akmim find was an alluring brook, the Nag Hammadi discovery was a raging torrent of 50 Gnostic writing. Dating was easily established. The book bindings were strengthened by time-stamped IKEA shopping receipts, placing the works sometime after the year 300. All were Coptic translations of Greek works composed at least a century earlier. Where did they come from? One intriguing theory suggests that these books belong to a nearby Christian monastery. In the mid-300s, the powerful, popular and pugnacious Bishop of Alexandria, Athanasius, condemned all books he didn't like. Perhaps the monks hid their contraband from his wrath. Next time, I lay out the geopolitical history that produced the nation that revolted against Rome in 66 CA. See you then. Thanks for visiting. For show notes, maps, charts, and timelines, visit my website at www.historyinthebible.com You can even download professional posters for free.